And welcome to today's episode of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. Liz Papani, owner of Marketing Initiative Works, is our guest. And oh, do we have a great show planned for you today. But before we get there, just let me remind you that this business talk show airs live on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 4 p.m. and Thursdays at our special time of 3 p.m. Of course, all of our shows can be heard live exclusively on Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net. If you're listening to the show as a podcast, we do encourage you to listen live during our broadcast times. Our show is brought to you by our valued advertisers, Brandman University, Center Club, Commercial Bank of California, Decision Toolbox, MBN Design, Smart Business Magazine, S&H Rubber, our longest tenured sponsor, Succession Strategies, Tone Software, and UPS Protection. The goal for this show is to help you, our listening audience of CEOs running middle market firms, to improve your decision-making skills. Liz, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure to have you here in the studio today. Let's start by asking you to share a little bit about your firm. What is it that you do? Why do clients hire you? And why would they select you over another firm that may say they do something similar? Well, my firm is a a marketing and branding firm, and what we do is we work with clients um, to really help them tell their brand story, Um, really try to understand what their key difference is, um, why they started their business in the first place, and really build the essence and the emotional side of their brand, not necessarily the functional, because when it comes to build, you know, clients and um, purchasing a lot of, you know, clients um, purchase from the emotional appeal. So we want to make sure that we do that. We also um, help um, clients really stop wasting money on marketing. Oh. A lot of companies are doing that That you know, because there's so much change is happening today. They um, think they need to be everywhere. So we kind of help them focus and let them know what they should be spending their money on, where they should be spending it, and then um, help them launch a product or service or really try if there's a product or service that is lagging mm-hmm. to really try to energize that. So those are the key things that we do. Okay. And your firm is Marketing Initiative Works. Um, you say help them tell their brand story. Yes. Does everybody have a brand story? Everybody has a brand story. Is it your experience that we entrepreneurs, business owners, know our brand story when you walk through the door? I think that majority of them know it. Okay. They just don't know how to express it and harness it for the benefit of their company. Okay. And do different people tell a different version of the brand story in a company? Yes, they do. So part of my process is when I go in and I do a brand audit and I talk to the stakeholders of the company, I talk to the employees. And I also talk to external customers and or suppliers or vendors, because what I'll find is everyone will have their own opinion, but there will be synergies and there'll be similarities. And that's really what I'm looking for, because what I try to do is I want to understand the current perception based upon what they say they are and what they really are. Okay. And and is it your experience, because mostly CEOs of middle market firms listen to my radio show, have you ever had the experience where the... The most compelling version of the brand story isn't the one the CEO is telling. In some cases, yes. Okay. And and so that's an opportunity to help them to understand there's something else out in the marketplace that plays better in Peoria than what you're saying? That is correct. I mean, really, it all comes down to, you know, what you are, because that's going to dictate your culture, the products that you've developed. Right. And, th- and when we go through that exercise, we may find out that some of the products or the services that you have don't fit within the story that you really should be telling based upon why people are currently buying from you or prospects will buy from you. Wow. And so then you have to change the behavior, huh? That's correct. That's not always easy. No, it's not. But there's ways to do that. And I think that in most cases for middle market and senior individuals is that, you know, it is, they are part of the brand. They, you know, they are the essence of the brand. Okay. And, um, you know, it's, it's about them harnessing that because a lot of them don't, they feel they're there to do, they believe they're there to do functional things. Yes. But they're really not. They're there. They are the essence of the brand. And we try to, you know, try to uncover the emotional side of that because that's really how not only employees, but customers and prospects, because they want to buy from brands that they like and that they trust. Right. And it, I, I think it's particularly difficult for service oriented firms to create true differentiation. And I think when you were saying about yes. the people, it really does come back many times to their, right. to them. 
That's correct. You know, service is a little bit harder, but when you look at it, the process is the same because you just have to look for that nugget. You have to look for that what's just a little bit different. And it's there. You just okay. have to help them uncover that. Okay. We're, uh, Liz, uh, l- let me ask you, what's your background? My background, believe it or not, um, I actually, I actually um, graduated college with a marketing degree many, many moons ago, believe it or not. And um, I started off on the client side, and I worked in manufacturing and tech for many years, and I worked in marketing communications uh, management positions. And then I wanted to do something different and get a, a broader spectrum or a better flavor mm-hmm. um, for marketing. So I went over and I worked, uh, I was at advertising agencies, okay. PR agencies. Um, I worked at a... Uh, um, branding agency. I worked at a direct marketing agency because I've always had a um, a love for behavior and language, and I think that you know, from my direct background, that's really understanding behavior and how to getting people to act, understanding how they read things, how they buy things, and um, so I have the experience um, not only from a functional but an emotional perspective. So you know, and then I took that experience and I opened up my own firm. Because I saw that there is a need for branding. One, it, we have to demystify it because people don't really understand what it is. It's kind of a bad word. Especially in the middle market yes. area, right? Yes. So what I try to do is I don't really call it branding. I talk to them about what is their passion, what's their mission or vision, mm. or talk to them about, you know, you know, what, you know, what, you know, what makes them tick. So I kind of take away the branding word and I and I focus more on, you know, the reasons, the principles, because they're gonna they'll relate to that more because okay. branding I think in terms of a word is, you know, I try to demystify that for, for companies. Yeah, I, I'm um, I think it's unfortunate that so many lower middle market firms, hundred million dollars and smaller, mm-hmm. don't invest in building brand equity and really have a focus on what their brand is because when you look at their bigger cousins, there's uh, so much of their perceived value can be tied up around their brand equity. That's correct. I mean, correct. you can really create an item on mm-hmm. your balance sheet that has significant opportunity to get, if you have a liquidity event, for mm-hmm. your brand. And it's almost not easier, but you can be more consistent in your brand messaging when you're a smaller company. Yeah, and, and you can be so much more flexible. You know, you don't have you don't have that rigidity. So I think that you know, I mean, that's a great point because my whole philosophy is strategy first. And if you don't know what your brand is and you don't know what your difference is or what your value is, then how are you expressing and building ongoing relationships? Are people buying your product and not buying it again? Are you in the? Are you going to be competing on price instead of total value? Which is what happens if you don't have differentiation, That's right? correct. Mm-hmm. How else do we as a consumer you, know which to choose other than, okay, well, you're all the same, so I'll just buy the cheapest I'll one. I'll just buy the cheapest one. So I think in terms of lower and middle tier, I think, you know, it's, branding is not a hard process and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money because I think that's some of the perception. Right. I think that, you know, it's the key is to understand the value that you bring and then project that in anything that you do. And it's not hard, it's easy, but you do need someone to help bring it out because I think that's the major hurdle. I agree. All right, we're going to take our first commercial break here on Critical Mass Radio Show. Got a lot more to talk about with Liz. This is a focused area for me. I think it's really something that's critically important for lower middle market firms to really be understanding what their brand is. And we're going to talk more about that with Liz when we get back after these words from our commercial sponsors. Can we talk about your family business? You know, that thing you put your whole life's blood, sweat, and tears into? Well, what happens when you retire or try and pass that business on to your children? At Succession Strategies, we can help you find the answers. We'll guide you through the unsettling process of protecting your family legacy and successfully passing your business on to the next generation, safely and securely ensuring that it'll both survive and thrive for generations to come. So ask yourself just one question. Can I really afford to wait? Take the first step. Take our complimentary self-assessment at SuccessionStrategies.com or call us at 714-560-9022 to set up a free consultation at your convenience. That's Succession-Strategies.com. 
I'm speaking with Joanna Stasiak Macbeth, Senior Vice President for Cash Management at Commercial Bank of California. Can you share with our audience Commercial Bank of California's approach to cash management? Absolutely. From simple online accounting reporting to a full cash management solution, we have exactly what your business needs. Our secure online access allow you to access your balance reporting, online electronic statements, stop payments, uh, process your outgoing international and domestic wires, process your ACH origination services. We also have online logbox services, target balance accounts, loan sweep, same day clearing presentment, and every other solution that your business will need. To understand the true power of how Commercial Bank of California can help you achieve your goals, give us a call at 714-431-7000 or visit us on the web at www.cbcal.com or at our new headquarters at 19752 MacArthur Boulevard in Irvine. Today's businesses are embracing voice over IP telephones and unified communication desktop technologies to more effectively communicate and collaborate with their customers, suppliers, and colleagues. The Reliatel management software from Tone Software Corporation helps organizations of all sizes manage their communications technologies to ensure great voice quality and better levels of service and reliability throughout their business. Through Reliatel, you'll gain higher return on investments from VoIP and unified communication technologies while lowering the associated operational support and maintenance costs. Learn more. Visit www.tonesoft.com or call 800-833-8663 for information on Reliatel by Tone Software, the solution for quality business communications. Welcome back to this edition of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. Liz Papani is our guest for this segment. She's the owner of Marketing Initiatives Works, and we're going to be back to her in just a second. But first, I want to let you know that I'd like to thank and acknowledge our listeners who download our show as a podcast. You've downloaded over 16,000 episodes during the last 30 days. And we here at the program appreciate your continued and growing support. We've doubled our downloads, our monthly downloads, since January of 2013 till this month. All of our shows can be heard live on octalkradio.net or rebroadcast anytime from iTunes, Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, hundreds, virtually hundreds of middle market companies' websites whose past guests have put the player on their website so that you can listen to their interview and other business-oriented podcasting services. All right, Liz, um, let's talk a little bit. You know, you've learned a lot. You had a varied career. You're kind of in the entire ecosystem there before you launched your firm. Um, do you have a guiding principle that you're using to lead and grow your firm? And if so, can you share that with our audience? Yeah, I mean, I think it's what I what I um, ex- express to my clients as well is strategy first and foremost. If we don't know where we're going, then we are not going to know the right way on how to get there. So we have to make sure that we do our due diligence and do our homework so we know before you know before we move. Also. One of the things is, you know, to lead, you also have to follow. You know, for my many years, you know, working in corporate and other agencies and managing, you know, large teams and things, everybody wants to know what the bigger picture is. They want to know why they're doing what they're doing, you know, and it's all about collaboration. It's all about teamwork. And in order to grow your business, it's all about, you know, giving back. You know, it's about, you know, giving and really doing what you love and what your passion is. Is it? Is it possible to distill a company's brand down into a few words? I mean, I think, of, and I don't know if Nike's just do it is a, what that is in the branding vernacular. Yeah. But just like when I see the swoosh, I think of Nike. Yeah. When I hear that term, regardless of who says it or in what context, mm-hmm. I sort of piece of me goes back to Nike. I mean, it, for lower middle market firms and entrepreneurial firms, do you try to help them? Is that a, is that a an idea worth pursuing? Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit because the swoosh is their logo and, you know, just do it is their tagline or their moniker. Okay. Those cannot be developed 
unless you do the branding architecture exercise and understand, you know, what are your key attributes? What are you aspiring to? What is the essence that you want your brand to be? What's your value proposition and what's your position? Mm. Because if we're not going to, if we don't work on that first, the swoosh and the just do it isn't going to happen. So one of the misconceptions there is in, in, in mid and lower okay. is that when they think about branding, they think it's their logo and their tagline. Well, your, your, your logo is a symbol of your brand and your tagline is a representation of what you want people to feel okay. and the affinity. But you can't get there unless you know yourself what your story is and what you want it to be. Wow. So it has to be organic, right? It has to be... It has to be organic, yes. you got to do the hard work before you get the easy things for people to identify you with. And and it's not hard. It's just a matter of, you know, working with somebody that, you know, knows the right questions to ask. Okay. Knows what to pull out. Okay. And then take that and massage that. Look at the competition. Look at what's happening in the marketplace. And make sure that, you know, they're building a unique but sustainable position for you oh okay so unique but sustainable in other words you could come up with something unique but somebody else it's not sustainable because because it's not relevant to the target that you're going after it's okay. not believable to the target that your your target audiences that you're going after really <laughs> you know i've i've seen a lot of larger firms who spend a lot of money on advertising and they come up with i guess the tagline and the tagline for me doesn't resonate it sort of feels like it falls flat or maybe it's disingenuous or it doesn't, to me, connect to their brand in any way. Or maybe you're not the target. Maybe I'm not the target. So it's not them, it's me. Well, it, right, it, well, it could be either way. <laughs> I, I respect that. <laughs> honesty is very good. We like honesty here. So part of your value is making that process not as difficult because you know how to guide companies right. through that process. It's not difficult. If it's done the right way, it's really fun. Fun? Yes. Well, I like fun. All right. Well, we're talking with Liz Papani, and she's the owner of Marketing Initiative Works, and we're talking about all things branding. Speaking of that, I know your firm has a blog, and I'm wondering if you could discuss some of the trending topics that you're seeing in your blog. Um, Three of the trending topics is what we've really been talking about today is how to craft your brand story. That, in terms of trending on my blog, is huge because I think that today, because of the social of our, you know, what's happening, not just with social media, but just social overall in terms of how people are doing business. Consumers and customers have so much control of our brands now, where before, if they only just saw an advertise, we, I mean, companies controlled their brand. Well, companies aren't really controlling their brand anymore because of all the reviews and things like that. I mean, customers are in control. So companies are struggling with one, how do they combat that? And two, how do they keep control of their brand story? So that's part of, you know, how do I tell it and how do I keep from, you know, how do I keep it from affecting my bottom line? Because that's another thing that was trending in terms of on the blog was branding and how it, and how you're, if you brand correctly, your bottom line will follow. Mm. Because if you're not out there listening to what customers are saying, or if you're not out there seeing what's going on and what people are saying on review sites and in social media and all the, you need to be proactive in doing that because then you can shape the story. If you're not out there and you think that, you know, you're sitting at, in your desk and you're not listening to what's happening, you know, from, you know, what's happening from a, the social sphere, you could be losing out, one, in finding out what's good about your brand and what people are looking for so you can update your messaging. Right. Or people might be saying things that you don't want your brand to stand for. Mm. So that that's, or, uh, those are, you know, two things that are really trending right now. I want to ask you, and mm-hmm. I don't mean to interrupt you, but... Uh, as I'm listening to you, I co- totally connect with it in a B2C space mm-hmm. with Yelp and the review mm-hmm. sites, mm-hmm. etc. C- can, can you share why that's important for companies that are in a B2B space? A- and where would those communities of conversation be if they're not on the traditional sites like I'm thinking of? Uh, I mean, how would they know the conversation? Let's talk about LinkedIn. Okay. Because on LinkedIn has so many groups today. Oh. And there's a lot of conversations happening right. on the groups. And people are always asking, you know, how do I do this? Or can you refer me to this? Or have you worked with this? So, you know, it's still a business site, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of communications and a lot of conversations happening on LinkedIn. Wow. And today, from a, whether you're B2B or B2C, 
branding is the same. There's two. There's a functional component of your brand, and there's an emotional component of your brand. And even if you are a business brand, emo- the emotional side of your brand is so critical today because no matter you know an individual is an individual whether they're purchasing something personally or whether they're purchasing something for business Uh there's an emotional connection you know if they're still buying a business type of product because some of it is lifestyle I mean look at the um, the um, uh, mobile companies you know how they um, it's all about lifestyle Right. Well, it's not just about lifestyle from a personal perspective, but it's a business lifestyle. Right. So I think brands from B2B need to, you know, take a, a, a different look that it's not about benefits and functionality. It's about emotion. Apple is a perfect example. And I can see that in, in the franchising space, too, that the franchisor needs to project the right brand to get the right franchisees to extend their brand. That's a B2B play. Right. But you really have... And and that's a, a business owner making a critical decision. So I could really see how branding could be critical for mm-hmm. companies that use a franchising system. I mean, think of branding as not a function. Think about it as your company and what your company stands for. You know, let's not think about it's a function okay. and it's going to cause. I mean, it is your company. It's, it's, the, it's every the core of it. It's then. the core and the nucleus of your company. Which is my next question, which you've already answered, but I will just ask you that. So then, how involved should the CEO of a middle market firm be in his or her company's brand? Very involved. Okay, because it's at the core of who they are. Right, and you know what? As the CEO of a small to mid tier company, they they dictate the culture and they dictate that brand and in some cases a lot of those companies those are the individuals that found that company right and they found it for a reason and they found it for certain passions and that's what we have to that's what we have to have them come out and and that's what we have to project we're talking with Liz Papani she is the owner of marketing initiative works uh, final question other than your website but before we get to your website um, can you share with us kind of a challenge or an opportunity that you're facing in building and growing your firm? You know, because of the industry that I'm in, um, marketing is changing rapidly every day. I mean, marketing's at the chasm right now because of everything that's going on. And I think there's a lot of confusion um, in the marketplace in terms of what companies really should be doing. But in terms of, so that for me is a challenge because as a marketer, I have to keep up on all that stuff too in terms of what's going on. But I also look at that as an opportunity for my business to grow because I have, you know, I've been doing it for a long time. And because this is my business, I keep up on everything that's going on. So that expertise um, helps me help companies to kind of focus and tell them what they should be doing and where they should be spending their money and not spend their money. Excellent. So if someone wants to learn more about you and your firm, how do they find you online, Liz? Um, they can go to my website, www.marketingiw.com. They can check out my LinkedIn page, which is probably, my, my website's being redone now. I mean, it's always, everyone's is perpetually being always. redone, right? right. But um, they can go to my LinkedIn page, uh, you know, linkedin.com uh, forward slash IN forward slash Liz Papani. Okay. And that um, will give a lot of information or you know they can just call you know I don't think that we talk enough (laughs) you know one on one anymore and then they can give me a call 714-595-0963 Liz thanks for being a friend of the program welcome to the critical mass community I appreciate what you're doing to help firms in your area of expertise and I've thoroughly enjoyed our talk today I did too and thank you so much for having me Rick it's our pleasure All right, ladies and gentlemen we're going to take our second commercial break here on critical mass radio show don't go anywhere Roger Heo is our second guest on the show he will be in in just a few minutes so stay tuned when it comes to pioneers in their respective industries We all know the Apples, Starbucks, and Trader Joe's of the world. In the realm of recruiting, Decision Toolbox is the industry's best-kept secret. With 90% of their business from referrals and repeat customers, for over 20 years, Decision Toolbox's U.S.-based team of recruiters, sourcers, professional writers, quality personnel, and tech support has perfected a Six Sigma approach to talent management. No matter the size of the project, Decision Toolbox delivers incredible results. A cost per hire less than half of what contingency firms charge. With the winning candidate presented in an average of 14 days. All with a 12-month candidate warranty. With results like that, Decision Toolbox won't be a secret for long. Visit us at www.dtoolbox.com for more information. 
Hey, did you know that over 73% of consumer packaged goods and retail products fail miserably within their first year? Why? Because they find themselves in the pit of unawareness. You don't want to go there. Call me, and I'll make sure that your packaging gets noticed. You know how I know? Because I'm the founder and creative director of MBN Design. We're one of Orange County's most established and trusted design firms. With over 20 years of experience, I can ensure that your brand will always stay new. Ask me how our packaging sold millions in months or see for yourself other success stories on our website at www.mbndesign.com. We're MBN because we're making brands new. Call 714-458-8701 and talk to me, Hector Garcia. That's my cell, 714-458-8701. I'll be waiting for your call. UPS Protection has been protecting systems in the U.S. against brownouts, blackouts, and poor quality power for over 25 years. We provide power protection systems, including UPS, lighting inverters, generators, and service for clients from coast to coast. We specialize in solving all your power needs. As a direct reseller of the best brands in the industry, including Liebert, Powerware, and APC, we can solve all your power protection needs. Protecting your power is our main goal. We offer on-site or depot repair of our critical equipment. To better serve your budget constraints, UPS Protection also offers both reconditioned and new products. Welcome back to this edition of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. As promised, Rod Trujillo, founder and CEO of International Rubber Products, is our guest for the next two segments. Before we get there, I just want to let you know that our audience demographic is 98% business owners and executives who listen to learn from the experiences of our guests. If your firm is interested in reaching these top decision makers, then advertising on the radio show is the answer. Each month, our sponsors gain valuable exposure to their support of the program. And with our exclusive and unique Prospect Engagement Program, Critical Mass Radio Show can deliver up to 23 warm prospects to each of our platinum advertisers annually. If you'd like to learn more about this program, then contact Rose Chamora at 951 515 Four six six one. That's five nine five one five one five four six six one. Don't call her right now. She's in the studio. If you're listening live, give me about a half hour, and then you can reach her because we don't want her phone going off while I'm interviewing Rod. Rod, welcome to the studio. Hi, how you doing? Great. Why don't we talk a little bit about your firm? Tell me about international rubber products. Like, what do you do? Who do you do it for? And why do clients choose your firm over their competitors? So we're uh, we we we're uh, more engineering driven than anything else. We okay. we focus on critical to function parts for three different segments. One would be medical devices, mm. uh, things used on rep- respirators, catheters, um, diabetes pumps. Um, another being um, uh, what you call critical to function rollers that work uh, with converters, uh, people like 3M, mm-hmm. Avery Dennison, in segments where you're trying to apply very thin coatings um, and yields uh, need to be pretty precise in right. the tens of thousands. So these are precision engineered parts then? Yeah, very, okay. very precise. Okay. Um, and then another one is uh, oil and gas, where we, we, we do a lot of focus around material sciences wow. and actually developing solutions that last longer, work yeah. better. That's a harsh environment, right? A very harsh environment. And, and the chemicals that in the, it could deteriorate the degrade the rubber products very yeah, quickly, so, right? Yeah, so, so the idea is always to add value through using our team and our engineering prow to make sure that it works better, okay. lasts longer, or... or is more value driven. Those are three demanding industries that you talked about and with very tight tolerances and very high expectations of a supplier. So for you to be successful in those spaces, you you didn't pick an easy way out, Rod. No, I did not. Okay. No, I did not. What's your background? So my background is I'm an entrepreneur, uh, but I've been in the rubber industry since 1989. Okay. Um, I'm... uh, it's it's hard to say all the things that I do because I'm really really well versed in numbers. I've done a lot of acquisitions. Okay. Um, and Always here in Southern California. Well, uh, no, I uh, I've gone through uh, I've, I've I've run the gamut. I've had companies all over the United States. I've really? actually had two companies in China. Wow. Uh, for about ten years and recently got out of that uh, that market for various reasons in order to try to 
uh, focus on our value-driven engineering, uh, you know, mission. Okay. Which is just, it's hard to, believe it or not, you have labor there, but uh, all the things that you hear about China, they're, they're really not as efficient or as innovative as we are. Wow. You know that firsthand because you've I been do. in that market. I do. So I think that's, that's good to hear from an experienced... Okay, bang the gong. I love these teachable learning moments on Critical Mass Radio Show because sometimes uh, we make the competitor bigger than they really are. That is right? very we, accurate. We focus on their strengths and we are constantly thinking about our weaknesses and sometimes it's nice to have it's someone... It's a $5 million mistake. Really? That's what it cost wow. when it was all said and done. Okay. Lessons learned, right? Yeah, we owned our own factory. Um, it, in the end, it took four Chinese people to do what one American could do. We had to have four full-time expats there in order to make sure our quality was up to, up to, and, and, and in the end, after 10 years, all the savings were not there, and when we brought everything back, wow. we were almost equal to what they could do there. Oh, so you, you reshored then. You, we reshored. Wow. So you're a living example, ladies and gentlemen, That's, of a manufacturing company, right? That is correct. Who couldn't build the parts any more competitively offshore than they could back here in the good old U.S. In, of A. In the beginning, we could. Okay. But then as, the, as, as inflation in China and everything came up. Right. There's wage inflation. It, it, it just, you couldn't because of the waste with the, with the Chinese worker. The Chinese worker likes to make one part and millions of them. Okay. And we weren't quite making millions, and we were trying to get them to switch like we do here in the United States, and they just they, they couldn't they couldn't grasp the concept. So, so we're talking specifically about international rubber products here on the radio show, and your other uh, businesses as your you know serial entrepreneur Rod Trujillo. But uh, what's your footprint for international rubber products? So international rubber products owns three main footprints. One of them is a company called uh, International Rubber. Uh, medical, mm -hmm. uh, which actually used to be Viking Rubber, but we, okay. we rebranded the name. All right. um, and then there's another one called Micron Rubber Products, mm -hmm. and then another one that's called Abba Roller. Okay. So those are the three platforms. So you have three platforms specific to the niches and the industries that you're in so that you really show up as a player in that space. Then. That is correct. Okay. And is that a strategy that you've used in other lines of business? In, in um, actually, I've, I've always been in the rubber industry. I've done about 13 transactions. Four of them have been divestitures, which Two of them were in China okay. when I sold to a private equity company, um, but uh, they're all—they've all pretty much been in the rubber industry, and I've just branched out into the different types of uh, value. I, I've focused now on value, mission-driven engineering, where our teams have got to solve problems. Okay. We've got to be more competitive. We've got to use robotics. We've got to use science. And uh, we've got to focus on just a team approach at arriving somewhere where nobody else can arrive. You know, y you remind me so much of an interview I did several years ago with the president of a company by the name of Connex. They're uh, a toy manufacturer. Mm -hmm. You may be familiar with them. Sure, They're I've heard of them. A bendable toy manufacturer out of Philadelphia. And uh, he's the only uh, construction toy manufacturer that manufactures in the United States that didn't go to Asia. And the way that he chose to do that was to put in advanced manufacturing practices. Yeah, that's, well, I mean, you know, what I, what I learned was I should have just relied on our thinking and our people and said, hey, they're at five cents, how do we get to five cents? And uh, if I'd have done more of that, I wouldn't have lost $5 million. Right, right, yeah. That's, <laughs> okay, bang the gong again. We really have to get one for this radio show because there's a lot of teachable <laughs> moments coming out, especially today. But um, chasing the low-cost labor isn't always the right thing to do, especially when you have an engineered product, right? Especially when you have an engineered product. But the one thing we don't understand as entrepreneurs sometimes is the economics looked really good. Right. And that's what kind of drove us there. Right. But what we didn't understand was the culture. And the culture was not the same culture. They weren't as hungry. They weren't as innovative. They needed, uh, they needed to give you an idea, they take naps in the afternoon. Um, you know, we would have people that, would, that were, you know, farm workers that would show up in suits. It was just a very strange right. culture that you just didn't understand. At the end of every year, it was just assumed that, you know, they were going to get bonuses regardless if the company made money or didn't make money. Mm. And so it led to all kinds of things we, that we that we experienced strikes and theft and the amount of theft that was going on internally by more than one person. It was like a team effort of, wow. and it was it was, it was a, challenging. <laughs> In a word, <laughs> it was challenging. challenging. <laughs> uh, free at last, though, right? <laughs> Pretty much, right. I, I, yeah, much are, nicer. Are you here, Southern California? Then we are. We okay. are. So you're a manufacturer of precision parts. In, in Southern yeah, California. Yeah, two locations. One's in San Clemente, one's in Ontario. So two are housed under one, one uh, 45,000 square foot facility in, in Ontario. Okay. And another one's housed in a 40,000 square foot facility, all clean room, medical oh, device grade uh, in San Clemente. I'd love to come and tour you, San Clemente. You're more than if welcome you're, anytime. If you'd be willing to. Any, I, anytime. I, I worked for Delphi. I was general manager and president. We were a, a connector 
manufacturer, I really get a kick out of seeing. We make connectors. Do you? We do make we make grommets and connectors. Okay, so you'll yeah. you'll you yeah. Delphi's a customer. Uh, oh, really? Yes. Oh, look at that! What a small world this <laughs> is. Huh? It all comes back around, ladies and gentlemen. I'm talking with Rod Trujillo. He's the founder and CEO of International Rubber Products. Tell me about from an entrepreneur, global entrepreneur's perspective, doing business in Southern California. Um, it's difficult. Um, what's difficult about it? Mainly the the fact that uh, you're paying for a lot of things that you don't feel you know you don't feel you're getting your return on you okay. know it, it be it you know uh, Southern Cal you know uh, uh, air quality control uh, so you're paying permits that you know what are you getting for all this and 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 that it's fine I mean it's part of the game but it, I, for example I just looked at a company to purchase in Texas and in reviewing the books of Texas I said to the owner I said. If I wanted to grow, if I wanted to expand this building because you have plenty of land, you know, what would I have to do? He says, you just call a contractor and expand. <laughs> that does not happen here. You've exactly. got to go to the city. You've got to pay permits. You've got to wait till they rubber stamp it. And it's just, it's just, they just make it more, they make it harder on entrepreneurs than they should, in my opinion. So I, my perspective on that is also if you can build a successful company in California, you can compete anywhere in the world. Absolutely. I would I would completely agree. And and again I go back to that one premise which is, you know, really putting our team in place. I mean, people are what make everything. It right. doesn't matter this radio show right now doesn't happen without people, right. without relationships. But challenging those people to think outside the box just because you know, they say China's cheaper. Eh, not, not so much. I mean, we can really think how to do it and what kind of robotics we can use and what type of engineering we can do differently, and, right. and we can win. And California, you have to throw in the same way. When I look at a different place, it's because, you know, they just continue to think it's okay to keep raising and raising and be like the leaders of, of, of charging state higher state taxes. And mm -hmm. they don't realize that we then look at it and go, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing everything in California. Right. Where else can I do this? Especially because yes. you you're, you have experience across the country and around the globe. So you have options as an entrepreneur, right? That is true. That's All right. Correct. We're going to take our next and final commercial break here on Critical Mass Radio Show. Roger Heo is our guest. He's founder and CEO of International Rubber Products. I'm having a great time interviewing him. Hopefully you're enjoying the conversation as well. We're going to come back, and I have some more questions for this serial entrepreneur after these words from our commercial sponsors. Business Network is a business-to-business -business multimedia company providing insight, advice, and strategy for C-level executives of fast growth, middle market, and large companies. As one of the nation's largest publishers of local management journals, under the Smart Business name, Smart Business Network publishes 19 regional print editions, presents dozens of large and small-scale business conferences and award programs, and produces a vibrant interactive digital media presence. For more information, visit us at www.sbnonline.com. SNH Rubber is a manufacturing company in Fullerton, California. We specialize in custom molded, extruded, and stamped rubber parts. If your next job requires a rubber part, we would appreciate the opportunity to quote on it. We serve aerospace, automotive, and many other industries. We work with many types of rubber, including silicone, EPDM, neoprene, uninitrile, and Viton. Our quality system is ISO and AS9100 approved. Over our 47 years in business, the SNH brand has become known for superior quality, quick turnaround, and competitive pricing. Please check out our website at www.shrubber.com or call 714-525-0277. Let SNH be your ceiling solution. There's something positive about the word up. When things are looking good, they're looking up. When someone's down, you cheer them up. So how do you move up? Well, when it comes to getting your bachelor's or master's degree, there's one university that stacks up, Brandman University. Brandman is ranked by U.S. News and World Report as one of the nation's top 10 universities for online bachelor's programs. Brandman's online graduate programs in business and education also receive top honors. So look us up at brandman.edu. Brandman University. Move up. Welcome back to this edition of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi, Raj Rahio, founder and CEO of International Rubber Products and serial entrepreneur is our guest in the studio. I'd like to thank and acknowledge our listeners who download our radio show as a podcast. You've downloaded over 16,000 episodes during the last 30 days. We here at the radio show appreciate your continued and growing support. 
All of our shows can be heard live on Internet Radio Station, octalkradio.net, or rebroadcast anytime from iTunes, Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, literally hundreds of middle market companies' websites whose CEO have been on the show, and they put the player on their website, just like Rod's going to do on his website after he's done with this interview, as well as various business-oriented podcasting services. So, Rod, you've learned a lot in your business experience, granted. Do you have a f- overarching philosophy, what I call here on the radio show, your guiding principle? And, and if so, can you share your guiding principle with our audience? Yeah, I'd say my guiding principle is building relationships with my uh, employees, my customers, and my vendors. And uh, really just trying to emulate uh, the the uh, the ways that uh, Jesus Christ ran his life. And it took me 14 years to realize that relationships and uh, conflict management and uh, really taking care of people really are the answer. I mean, I was more focused on how much money I could make. I was more focused on the material possessions that, that I had, what the balance sheet looked at. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't until I realized that, you know, that's not really what makes a company. What makes a company is helping each other, uh, that be it a vendor, that be it a customer, that be it your employee that's, you know, in the back and shipping and you don't know when you walk by what kind of compassion you have towards that employee who maybe just lost, you know, uh, a family member. Right. So was there a tipping point for this? Was there something that happened? There was. I I think about about three years ago, um, you know, we were fighting through the 08 downturn. We were fighting through all the things that that I had created in China. And I met my partner, a gentleman by the name of Casper Zublin, and and, uh, we just decided we were going to do different we were going to do things differently we weren't we weren't going to be about um you know what how fast we could get there or how much money we could make we were going to we were just going to try to put our relationship in the middle try to make sure that uh, that everybody we touched we blessed and vice versa and so it's kind of a different different guiding principle than most but uh, at the same time we're, we're you know we're both extremely financially savvy so i mean we we do understand that we're for profit and we have to do things uh correctly but that's kind of what uh what what i feel is making a difference do you attribute that to the downturn to the to the great recession i mean was i think that- i attributed to to the downturn i think it attributed to maturity i think okay. it, it attributed right to time. yeah just just uh thinking about things differently thinking about relationships differently thinking about what why we're here and you know do i have a purpose or am i trying to take or am i trying to give and i i'd, I'd rather be a giver than a taker uh-huh. and i have i you know i have a funny suspicion that all of a sudden my balance sheet grows which it has and really? we yeah it's it's you know things are things are better than they've been in in a long time we're we're headed back to the peak but we just have a different philosophy i used to be the kind of guy that was so driven that you couldn't stop me mm-hmm. um and uh, and i grew at 40 percent, and i and i accumulated a lot and i have still have very very nice things that i that i that i pride but they're not my soul uh, value and my sole mission. Mm. My 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 value and my mission are really to hopefully touch people and make them better. And the things that I've learned, try to pass on to the people that work with me and work around me. And, and I hope I'm a blessing to their families as well. So I'm talking with Rod Trujillo. He is the CEO of International Rubber Products. Did you get feedback from your employees? Did they notice a different Rod? Oh yeah, I think anybody that uh, that knew me. 10 years ago or 12 years ago in the last three years has seen it completely different. I'm still driven. I'm right. still, I still want to succeed, but I just don't, I don't, uh, I don't think people are uh, a commodity. Right. I, I really value that, you know, like I said, I come back to, there's a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion. And if you really understand where somebody else is walking or where they came from or, or why they reacted, how they reacted, you really start to realize that, you know, we, we can all think that, you know, we, we're, we're all that, but we're not. Right. And I, I find that mentality in the CEO of a company can be a determinant in how engaged your employees are in the company. I think you'd find that uh, that I have got, I'm uh, very fortunate, I'm very blessed because I've had a lot of guys that have been working with me for a long time and they've actually put up with me, kind of like my wife who's who's probably uh, the sure best she, the best thing that's ever I'm happened sure to me. I'm sure she's a saint. I'm sure she's a saint. Okay. And, and having a, a person that generally cares about them, the, the employees give back so much more to the company because they Agreed. know you care about them. Agreed. Without the employees, there's, you know, you can't have a good customer without a good employee. Right. All right. I'm talking with Rod Trujillo, and I'm going to ask you about a challenge now. We've talked about the China challenge, but now the economy's rebounding, right? You're, you're saying you're moving towards the peak. I know that in growth, 
there are challenges. Sometimes th there are serious challenges in growth to do it right and do it profitably and maintain your quality and the rest of that, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. But is there a current challenge that you and the executive team are kind of wrestling with and you're working on? You know, there's a few. Um, uh, up until uh, up until uh, uh, a year ago, our challenge was, was our financial banking partner, but that's changed because we have a really good bank now and a great relationship with uh, Ash Patel over at Commercial Bank. Um, but I would say skilled labor. Um, In what area? Well, there's the, you know we've got really good employees, but what I find is that a lot of the younger generation is focused more on you know uh, computer science. They're focused more on uh, you know doing different kinds of jobs and they're not interested in hey you know how to how, you know how, how do I run an injection molding machine right and so the challenge as we grow 20 30 percent is really figuring out how to train and get those those that younger generation interested most of the companies that I go out and buy, look at to purchase the guy has been running them you know 30 40 years he's 70 years old right. and his kids don't want the company they, they, can you imagine that his, his kids are investment bankers <laughs> the business is done. <laughs> they're, great. In IT, uh, yeah, they're in IT. They're in IT. Computer science. They right. want nothing to do. So I would say skilled labor and really just being able to teach them and train them and and, and the the way we do business. And it also kind of ends up coming over to business development as well because a lot of people it's not sexy. And so you know as as, as and if you looked at some of the parts we make, they're really sexy. But right. it's finding the right group of people that 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 really want to go in this direction. And 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 you've uncovered what I think is a macroeconomic um, trend that we have to we have to deal with. I was at the Cal State Fullerton economic forecast a week or two ago, and there is a definite skills shortage in this country. And as as our manufacturing base grows, comes back, low cost fuel, you know, petroleum, oil, etc., and, and we're reshoring, it's going to exaggerate that problem. And there's there's a wide group of people who don't have the skills for the current job environment those and their um prime working age those are the people we should be training for these type of jobs these are good jobs that you can make a career at well i'll tell you one of the things that i see that i don't think is happening enough is the robotic side of it you you don't know how much these manufacturers how we're going to compete against the world is with people that understand how to run ro ro robots right and how to maintain them and stuff and that's you know it's kind of no different than if you look at the computer sciences area and how many people have turned into you know hardware specialists or software programmers really and 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 there's a big move movement happening and we know because we're helping manufacture some of those robots okay. with parts. Okay. okay, yeah. So you're seeing the and volumes, so you, right? you'll take you'll take a Google who's bought eight robotic companies in the last year and we're doing business with two of them mm. and they're going into fulfillment centers that have 500 people and when they leave there's not that many there's 20 right. 30 people right with robots that are running the fulfillment center so i see an opening there for 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 you know uh not just engineers but but you know techs that can work on these robots right. almost like on the on the computer sciences right. side and tool and die manufacturing tool oh. and die people yeah. welders these are critical skills that you have to apprentice to learn how to do and when you have somebody who knows how to make tool who knows how to make tools and dies they're they're gifted they're an, they're an artist oh man right they are, they are amazing i mean right. i i gotta tell you most of of when you're starting to do tool and dies the the guys i mean I, we have one guy ralph Mezzanini, who is he, he, this guy he make you the own tool he'll make the actual tool to machine the part but those are a dying breed <laughs> exactly they're a dying breed and right. and, it, and it's not it's not that you can't go buy the tool buy the tool sometimes takes a week but the guys that can go in and make them like that, that's what we don't have as much anymore. And that, that kind of thinking, that critical thinking where you're thinking outside of the box instead of the box that everybody's putting you in, really is what separates good companies from great companies. I totally agree. And and I think the best thing you can do for, an, for a neighborhood is put a well-run manufacturing company in that neighborhood. I would agree. That is the best thing you can do. Um, it creates jobs. They need an ecosystem. You need a supply base. There's so many things that a well-run manufacturing company can do for the neighborhood. That's where we should be really, I think, with this manufacturing renaissance that I think we're on the precipice for here in this country. That's where we need to have our politicians, local, state, federal, really focused on that. And a lot of good things will happen in this country. I would completely agree, 100%. Great. Okay. So we only have about a minute left here on the radio <laughs> show. I kind of got lost in your eyes there just talking about <laughs> all this stuff. So um, tell me, how does somebody learn more about your firm? So, I mean, I would think the best way would go to uh, www.irpi.com. 
What is that again? Uh, IRPI, IRPI, International Rubber Products Incorporated, and then most we have subsets, but uh, you, that's the easiest way to find us. And, okay. And uh, you know we've we we we've got plenty of guys that uh, on the on the phone, so you just call in and say hello, and we'll be happy to take care of you. Uh, I want to thank you for being a friend of the program. Welcome you to the critical ma- cra- critical mass community. I really enjoyed this time together with you, Roger Heo. Thank you for your time. Not a problem. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for this episode of Critical Mass Radio Show. I can't leave without thanking our valued sponsors because without our sponsors, uh, we wouldn't be here probably. Brandman University Center Club. Commercial Bank of California, Decision Toolbox, MBN Design, Smart Business Magazine, s Rubber, Succession Strategies, which is our longest sponsor, and we appreciate their, their support, Tone Software, and UPS Protection. I also want to thank the team that puts this show together. Paul Roberts is our engineer. Crystal Nunley is our producer. Amanda Pointer is our assistant producer. Our guest coordinator is Kathleen Shepard. Marketing strategist and live events manager is Asia Celestino. Our social media manager is Melissa Padani. VP of Sales sitting right behind me is Rose Chamora. And I'm your host, Rick Franzi. If you'd like to learn more about the Critical Mass for business business lines, maybe you want to advertise on the radio show, visit Critical Mass for forbusiness.com. This is your host, Rick Franzi, saying until the next show, I hope all of your business decisions will move your company in a positive direction. <laughs>